Life is changing in Greenland. For sled dogs, out of work because the ice no longer reliably supports their sleds, and for Inuit kids whose families have moved to the capital Nook as their traditional way of life has gotten harder. Because the ice is changing because of climate change. I'm here to see that change. It matters to the world because the vast ice sheets here and in Antarctica have long kept the world's climate stable. Now, that ice is melting at an accelerating rate, and we, as a human race, are on uncharted territory. There might be gunfire, there might be an ice break. Our guide on this boat in Alulisat's ice fjord is Torbjorn Randrup. And on this early September day, it's warm. Greenland's warmest September heat wave on record. So what are we seeing over here with the cracks coming down the ice? Melting ice that rips through the icebergs like a, 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 a saw. And that's also what creates the calvings. The calvings are dramatic. Tourists come here to see them. I'm here for something more. As an American, I've lived at a time when fossil fuels have powered American prosperity and fueled climate change. As a public radio correspondent in China and Southeast Asia, I saw how those places followed our lead. Now, other emerging economies around the world are doing the same thing, and I want to see the impact here on the ice sheet itself. It's mind-bending to be in the midst of this. It's like walking on a frozen ocean caught mid-wave. With me is Marco Tedesco, a climate scientist from Columbia University who's been coming here to do research for two decades. You've come here many times. You've done research trips over the last 20 years to the ice sheet. When you look around at the state of the ice here, what is the ice saying to you now? The ice uh, speaks many languages. Uh, over the past decades, has been only, not only talking to us, but screaming to us. Screaming that this ice sheet, three times the size of Texas and up to two miles deep, is not as eternal as it looks. Marco already saw signs that the ice sheet was in trouble when he was here on a visit in 2013 with 60 Minutes correspondent Leslie Stahl for the documentary series, Years of Living Dangerously. Wow, this is a lake? I can't get over You can that. see we are really in a basin, and the, all the water starts collecting here. And you can see really these cracks here. You see you in the, mean underneath? You, you can see, definitely. Yeah. What you're seeing is that the water has been flash, flashing away the yeah. snow. The number of lakes is actually increasing. The more lakes, the more ice melt, which warms the ocean and eats at the ice from below. Marco wants to show me how the ice sheet looks these days from above. So we head to the Conger Luswak Airport. It served as a U.S. military base during and after World War II, when the U.S. had several bases in Greenland. Now it has just one, but the melting ice has renewed superpower interest in Greenland, with the U.S. and China competing over access to minerals and strategic positioning. Our pilot is Mia Bilman Larson from Air Zafari. She tells us that when she was flying in the summer of 2021, she saw what looked like fog at a time when there were huge wildfires in Siberia and in the United States. The fires that they had had, the smoke actually came all the way up to Greenland. So this is kind of That's, crazy. So you have, you have uh, CO2 emissions from the world, including the states, affecting the melting in Greenland. And then climate change being at least partly responsible for the droughts that cause forest fires, mm -hmm. wildfires. The soot from that comes here and then speeds melting. So you've got this vicious cycle yeah. going on. Yeah. We head out to take a look. Making a little steeper turn, just coming around here. So hang on, on our left here, we're seeing this hill rising. It doesn't have any ice on it. What's that? The, the contrast between the green and the brown that you're pointing, that was ice until very recent. That's something to be worried about? Well, definitely yes. Then think about how small we are and think about the damage you're making. Uh, it's, uh, it's incredibly powerful, the, the, activity, the consequences of the activity of, human, uh, of the human being on, on our planet. Scientists have been making that same point for decades. Here's renowned planetary scientist Carl Sagan 
testifying before a Senate committee in 1985. Temperature. And here we are pouring enormous quantities of uh, CO2 and these other gases into the atmosphere every year with hardly any concern about its long-term and global consequences. He said that 37 years ago. And yet, over the past half century, we've almost doubled global CO2 emissions, with the United States and China leading the way. As a result, some scientists say, Greenland's ice sheet has passed a tipping point that could have a domino effect, speeding up ice melt at both poles, intensifying hurricanes, heat waves, droughts and wildfires around the world, and raising sea levels by several feet by the end of this century, affecting hundreds of millions of people. Out on the ice sheet, Marco tells me this is the climate equivalent of a five-alarm fire. We have a, a moral obligation and an economic need to face the consequences of climate change, whether we want it or not, whether we like it or not, or whether we know or not. This is already happening and is affecting everybody. More climate extremes may cause hunger, mass migration, even conflict. So the goal is to hit global net zero emissions by 2050 by cutting use of coal, oil and gas and pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. Scientists say if we do that, temperatures will stop rising within a few years and greenhouse gases will start dropping out of the atmosphere within a few decades. The good news is the U.S., China, and others are already ramping up renewable energy, now that it's cheaper to use than fossil fuels. And even in the midst of superpower competition, the two sides reached a non-binding agreement at COP26 last year to reduce greenhouse gases. Climate envoys John Kerry from the United States and Xia Jianhua from China brokered the deal. Now the two largest economies in the world have agreed to work together to raise climate ambition in this decisive decade. In the area of climate change, there is more agreement between China and U.S. than divergence, making it an area with huge potential for our co cooperation. But to get to net zero emissions in time to make a difference, China needs to wean itself off of coal more quickly, more Americans need to embrace electric vehicles rather than cheap gas at the pump, and emerging economies need to jump straight to renewable energy, though they need richer countries that cause the problem in the first place to help them be able to afford it. I want to hear how the younger generation here in Greenland feels about all this, so I visit the capital Nukes one high school where I find students in a spirited dodgeball tournament. Later, students Oscar Isbothason and Aya Lyberth Jepson tell me they know their generation can't dodge tough decisions on climate change. If it's warmer, like we have rain in the in winter, that's pretty annoying. I don't want that. I just want the, the weather to be stable. If the weather gets even more unstable and more annoying, that will sadly maybe make me move away, which is sad because I do really love Greenland. Is there anything you'd like people outside of Greenland to understand about Greenland as they think about climate change? They need to know that their action is not only affecting Greenland because of the ice melting, but it's also affecting them. So they need to think about like their decisions before they do the actions because it's not only affecting us, even though they don't really know about Greenland.